So far in our series this this year at Life Center, we've had an overarching theme that we've been going with called uh, "Build Your House." Right, and that's the idea. Like we've had declarations that we've been praying through the year. We did a couple last week. We did the two that we've done, the the one at the beginning of the year, and then the the prayer that we had uh, for the new year. And we've looked at this in order to see how God wants to build this house. We need His presence with us to build that house. And that was our our first series that we looked at. And we need Him both individually and as a group. We need His presence. We need to know our position in God. And that was our second series that we went through, was looking at our position as God, with God as His children, as kingdom citizens, knowing where we stand with Him. And then after taking a pause uh, for Christmas in our 21 days of prayer where we looked at God with us and then we focused on spiritual disciplines, we now return to that overarching theme again of looking at build your house. And so over the next five weeks, we want to look at power, the idea of power when it comes to God building his house. Now, we may be looking at it not in uh, the same way that most people would think of power or how you might uh, think we're going to look at it. What we're going to do is we're going to look at how, in regards to God building his house, how power affects us, how the powers that be affect us. And we're going to look at uh, godly powers, and today we're going to look at uh, ungodly things uh, as we dive into the powers that affect us and affect God building his house. And I know that it's going to be a series that will be challenging for us, hopefully liberating and, um, quote unquote, empowering for us. I know, insert pun there, right? So power, though, is something that we should have an understanding of. Because we are, in one way or another, subject to power. And so the better we understand power in our relationship with it, the better we can navigate our world in our relationship with God and others. And so to start off today in this series, what we're going to be doing is taking a look at the power of sin. The power of sin. Yeah, we're tackling an easy one right off the start, right? An easy one, one that we should all be, you know, just like, why are we even talking about this? We should have this down, right? But sin, you know, we might think uh, is a concept that, again, if you c- have come to church at all uh, in, in, your, in your past, you would have some idea of what it's about. Depending on the faith tradition you've been in, your familiarity or your relationship with the idea of sin and the power of sin can vary from having it beaten over your head to having maybe more of a nobody's perfect absolution of uh, how sin really affects us. So why do we look at the power of sin today? Well, maybe I can put it to you this way. Have you ever, have you ever had your car or your house uh, make a noise that didn't sound natural or regular in, in the way it sounded? Have you ever had that happen, right? Yeah, some of you have. We, recently, we did it with our house. And how many of you, though, have also ignored that sound, hoping that it would just go away, that it was just a temporary thing. You know, you're just like, I don't know, this doesn't sound normal, but you know, well, whatever. You know, you probably have done that as well, right? Yeah. We were tempted to do that with the noise that we heard in our house as well. But how many of you regretted that decision when that little noise turned into a much louder noise or a much bigger problem that all of a sudden went from an easy fix to a much more complicated and expensive fix? Yeah, yeah, you've been there, right? Well, fortunately, the house noise that we heard, we woke up one Saturday morning and it sounded like the furnace was making a weird noise. It was making this extra loud, like, almost like a metal on metal type of like <laughs> noise. And I was like, oh man, is, is one of the fans gone? Is it like blowing air and it's making noise and it's weird? Because it sounded like you could hear like this metal noise and it was just like, it was like rhythmic and just making that noise. And we were like, oh man. And I was like, oh, I had to get up so early on a Saturday now because it was like early because the, the furnace was kicking on to warm the house up before we get up, right? And so it, I was like, oh, I don't want to have to get up. And I'm laying there and it's still making the noise. And then 
And then Ingrid actually woke up and heard it, and she couldn't handle it as much as I could. So she got up, and she started, she went down to where the furnace is, and she starts looking. And all of a sudden, I hear, oh, my goodness. And I'm like, all right, now I have to get up. <laughs> Fortunately, it, was, it wasn't for very long that that noise had been being made, and we were able to catch the problem because it wasn't just a fan that was like, you know, seized or rattling or stuck or something like that. Uh, it was the outside water line from our going outside to the backyard that one of the, the 90 degree angles, the pipe had split. And it was behind the furnace, and so the water was spraying against the side of the metal of the furnace. Thus, the reason why it sounded like something metal, you know, because it was just hitting the sheet metal in a fine, like, power spray. And so it was, like, very good that we caught it within a few minutes because, you know, the, the water was starting to build up in the, in the furnace room. But here's the thing. Right? When we hear those noises, we hear those things and we want to ignore them. We, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. I can just, I'll, I'll deal with it later. Right? That's minor. That's minor compared to the power of sin. That's nothing compared to what sin can do when we leave sin and let it just, hopefully it'll go away or I'll deal with it later or it's not having that big of an effect. So we look at the power of sin because stopping and taking time to face sin head on, we actually grow in our understanding of the power of God's grace. Not understanding the power and effects of sin, it lessens our understanding of the power of the cross. See, in our culture, the, sin, the concept of sin is quite maligned. We can see people talk of evil and wrong, but it's not sin that they're usually talking about. It's people that are meant when they say evil and wrong. That's what they mean, not an underlying condition of the soul. But at the same time, sin in our culture is also watered down to benign things that rob us of our understanding of its actual power. We think of sinful pleasures And they're really just what? The late night snacks and treats that we eat that we shouldn't have late at night. We think of lies, but they're little and they're white, which means that they're almost necessary, aren't they? Like we had to say that lie. We had to cover something up. Why do we have? Because it helped us avoid conflict. Things would be so much worse if I had to tell the truth in that situation. We justify it. Or our brokenness, the things that we do and say and the way we act, we say something like, it's just the way I am. You don't like me because I'm too abrasive? It's just the way I'm made, you know? That's just who I am. Or sorry, not sorry. I've offended you, but I'm not really sorry because you needed to be offended because I needed to get my point out. We justify our sin. I don't know, it, it may, I don't mean it to be... Uh, The next line I'm going to say as far as like things like addiction, and I'm not talking about like when somebody gets so chemically dependent or so heavily dependent that it's gone beyond and it's now a sickness, but the addiction of like, I can't turn off my TV or I can't stop scrolling or I can't stop doing something and we've allowed a behavior to become so habitual that it is entrenched in us, the indulging of things. Those are words that we use to describe behavior when we could simply use the word sin. In it all, what we end up doing is we lose our moral compass through it all. Our ability to discern what's right from what's wrong, what's good from what's evil. Those concepts deviate into things that are seen my way, which is right and good. And things that are seen in other people's way who are different than me, which is wrong or evil. Looking at it like this, we can all admit that the innate danger of those types of views, the division it brings, it brings it in marriages, in families, in churches, and in our culture. 
And if I take a moment just to talk about this, no matter our stance, no matter my stance, no matter your stance on convoys or mandates, on safety, security, or freedom, seeing people as an enemy at this point, as opposition, as evil, will always lead to division. Do you hear me? Will always lead to segregation. Will always lead to disunity. When we want to view others in that way. And so I want to take a minute right now just for us to pause. And so we can pray for peace. Peace for our country as people across our country want to express their opinion on where things are. And other people want to counter express their opinion on who those people are and how things are going. Let's just take a moment to pause and pray. God, we come before you as observers, but also participants in what's going on in our culture. And God, we just seek your peace for our nation. We seek your peace for our people of this country. We seek your unity for our nation. That God, we pray that mandates or vaccines or convoys or whatever would not divide us. But God, that we would see each other in our humanness, in our brokenness, but in the fact that we are all in this together. And no matter where we stand on that spectrum of belief or, or ideologies, God, I pray that we would first see each other as brothers and sisters. And we would have the grace to deal with each other in that manner. Where we choose to disagree, we will do so peacefully, respectfully, lovingly, always looking out for the best interest of others. And when we choose to support, we will do so lovingly, and in unity with all. So God, we just pray for your peace to reign in our hearts, your unity to be our desire as we try to live within our culture and see that spread. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Off that soapbox and we'll move on. All right. So as individuals, though, in this culture that we're dealing with, we fail to look at sin and its power. And our only recourse then is dealing with symptoms because we don't look at it as sin. We look at it as problems and issues and people being evil and things being wrong and injustice, but without looking at it as, as its course thing is sin, sin. And so then it's symptoms that we look at that manifest from its bro- the brokenness. And all that we can apply to it then the sin is band-aids. Dallas Willard in his book, The Allure of Gentleness, says it like this for us. Our social and psychological sciences stand helpless before the terrible things done by human beings. But they somehow cannot admit to the ruined condition of the human will and that of our mind, feelings, body, and social relationships are warped. Are we like the farmer who plants crops according to the best methods available, but cannot admit to the existence of weeds and insects? All he can think to do is to pour on more fertilizer. Similarly, the only solution to our human problems we know today is education. Indeed, education is a good thing, but do we really think that if people generally understood what the right thing to do is, that they would do it? Isn't that true? We look at our culture and we, we don't know because we don't, we don't acknowledge it as sin. And so the only thing we know how to do is try to heap more fertilizer on because we can't acknowledge the weeds and the insects and the blight that can happen to what we thought we sowed into, what we thought was good seed that was going to produce a great harvest and is going to be awesome. We don't account for the effects of sin. And so we just try to heap more on in order to see it grow the way we thought it should. How we deal with sin isn't just an education. It's not just a journey or navigation through life. It is a battle. And it's a battle that's never, again, uh, 
fought against others. It's fought uh, against, we fight against temptation. We fight against our own sin as we live out our lives in a world that's not what it could be. It, Paul, in writing Ephesians to the Ephesians or the church in Ephesus, he, he says this, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's where our fight is. As we've talked about in this last series and in previous series, our fight is against the flesh inside us, the enemy who we call the devil or Satan, and the powers of this world, the principalities, those that work under Satan's rule. And then when we look to understand sin and its power, we start right at the very beginning. See, when God created the heavens and the earth, it was perfect, just as he intended. But then sin entered the world. And through the actions of Adam and Eve, believing a lie, abdicating their place as stewards of creation, choosing less than God's ideal for them, has done nothing but given us the inheritance as their offering, as their offspring of sin both in all created things and in our nature, it has been corrupted. Sin, therefore, is anything less than God's ideal. And God hates that. God hates sin because it destroys, because it brings death. Sin always results in death. In that same, uh, same book that Paul was writing to the church in Ephesus, he states this, which is, uh, if you were reading through the book of Ephesians with us over, that la- over the last week, you would have read this part. And it is so key to how our understanding of the condition of sin for us. Because it says this, As for you, you were dead, dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air and the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Notice who Paul says you are are dead to and who you are subservient to. The flesh, our enemy, and the powers and principalities of this world. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. And like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. That's the condition we find ourselves in, dead in our sin. And we all wrestle with the sin nature in us and the power that it has. And so today, I'm asking three questions for us to kind of work through. How does sin present itself? How does it present itself to us? And how do we see the consequences of sin? And then how do we respond to the power of sin in us and in the world? So sin, it shows up in three different ways that I'll I'll, I'll say. And the first is this. It shows up both individually and in community. And the way, way I look at that is I fall short. I sin. Individually, I don't measure up to God's ideal. I can't. I never will in my own strength. I'll always fall short of God's ideal. And unfortunately, got some bad news. You fall short too. As individuals, there's times where you just don't measure up to what God's ideal is. I know. I know. If it's the first time you've heard it, You have to brace yourself for that one. But we all, we all fall short of God's perfect ideal. And so it shows up individually in our lives when we we satisfy our own desires versus God's ideal. But it also shows up in us as a community. It can show up in us as a church community. It can show up in, in us as a city or a regional community, as a culture, as a nation. We can be guilty of collective sin, where we as a whole choose to act and believe and have an ideology that is contrary to what God believes. If you struggle with that, you can look through much of the Old Testament and see how God 
both dealt with individuals and their sin, but also with nations and cultures as they embraced behaviors and ideologies that were contrary to his best. We see that it has its effect. Another way that sin uh, presents itself and shows itself is this. It shows itself in the inner world and in the outer world. Sin presents itself both inwardly and outwardly. Our thoughts and feelings that we may never express outwardly, that we may never take action on, can still be born in sin. Just as much as the sins that we commit that people could see. Violence and theft and lying and and, and betrayal and things like that. The heart is the most deceitful thing. That's why Jesus talked about how hating someone was equal to murder. Because the heart and the things that we commit in our heart are just the same as if we were to do it with our actual actions. And so we see, we have those there. We see sin is both an action that we commit, but underlying the actions we commit is this. It is a condition that we are in. It is more than just the, the accumulation of individual actions that sin shows up in our lives. It is an underlying condition that we all deal with. Something that if you were only to sin once, your whole life, you're still guilty of sin your whole life. It's not just that one moment at that one time and then the rest was all perfect and, you know, the balances should weigh out in your favor in that moment. It's a sin condition that, that affects us entirely. Ignatius of Loyola said this, sin is the unwillingness to trust that what God wants for me is only my deepest happiness. Go back to the garden again. God created, and it was perfect. It was beautiful. It was just the way he wanted. And he walked with humanity, and it was bliss. It was happiness. It was our utter fulfillment as humanity. And then we left it. We didn't trust that what God was giving us was for our deepest and best good. And here's the thing, when we look at how we try to do this as, as individuals and as a people group, we try to make our society and our, 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 the way we live, to try, we try to mitigate the effect of sin, but while all earthly kingdoms, empires, countries, government systems, we can adopt Christian values into them, hear me, none of them are the kingdom of God. Not one country or nation or rule or type of rule will be the kingdom of God. They can reflect parts of that kingdom, but unless Jesus is sitting on the throne of that kingdom, then somebody else is. And if somebody else is on the throne, then it's not the kingdom of God. So here we are. How do we reflect this kingdom? In North America, we're entering a post-Christian culture. And uh, author and uh, pastor Mark Sayers helps us to look at the, the difference between like a pre-Christian culture and a post-Christian culture because they're not the same thing. They're, they're different. We can't look at post-Christianity and go like, man, we're just, we're just going to like evangelize everybody again like they've never heard anything before. I never knew anything about God before. And it'll be, it'll be wonderful. But it's not quite like that. Post-Christianity is not pre-Christianity. Rather, post-Christianity attempts to move beyond Christianity while simultaneously feasting upon its fruit. Post-Christian culture attempts to retain the solace of faith while gutting it of the costs, commitments, and restraints that the gospel places upon individual will. Post-Christianity intuitively yearns for the justice and the shalom of the kingdom while defending the reign of the individual will. Doesn't that sound like our culture? Peace and justice for all, but don't restrain how I live out my life. And in layman's terms, we could say it like this. We want the kingdom, all the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. We want all of that but without the king. 
in our ever-increasing search for liberty, on our own, without God, untethered from the truth, is it any wonder why we're hitting the dead end of legalism? both within church and in society, the idea of legalism leading us. And it leads us then to the consequences of sin. What are those? On an individual level and in a group level, we we find ourselves doing these things. We must always perform. We're always looking to do better and be better. We try to fix everyone around us. And everyone tries to fix you, don't they? We live outraged by the sin of others, but not humbled by its presence in our own lives. The line between accountability and canceling has become so blurry. We have little capacity for grace, so we have very few pathways for redemption and reconciliation. Do you hear that last one? If there's no grace for people, how can we reconcile? How can we have redemption if there's no margin for error in other people's lives from us? Fleming Rutledge, in a commentary on on the book of Romans, said this, Sin is mankind's essential illness. It is a condition we are all heir to. It is a demonic power that enslaves us and binds us and perverts us from being either good or free. We are responsible before God for sin, and yet we are unable to liberate ourselves from its grip. We are in a desperate situation, deserving of God's wrath, marked out for his judgment, each of us individually and all of us collectively. Sin has consequences. Paul, in his letter to the church in Rome, explained our condition like this in Romans 7. He said, So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man that I am. It's power. The power of sin leaves us children of wrath, prisoners to the law of sin with death as its only end. And it affects every type of relationship that we have. It it affects our relationship with God, with others, with ourselves, and with the world. See, we separate ourselves from God through sin. We hurt him But then we also hurt ourselves by our actions with sin. We hurt others with our actions of sin. And in a compounding way, we create the chaos of this created world. The Bible talks about how sin can affect others. And it lists it down and says, sin can affect all the way to the fourth generation. Its power isn't just in a moment. It has a ripple effect that can last for generations. This ripple effect isn't just in a puddle. It can be so far reaching. And I don't say this to heap condemnation and shame on any of us for our trespasses that may have wounded others. Some of you may be sitting here thinking and and thinking of the things that you've done and how it has had a ripple effect on others and the the, the effect that it had. I'm not trying to reap shame or, or heap shame or condemnation on you, but just to, again, show us the depth of our sin condition. It's utter destruction that we do not have the power to change on our own. Sin creates in us systems and behaviors, practices and customs that become ingrained in us and become systemic in our culture. Even if we take something like instant gratification, we want something and we want it right now. Say something as small as coffee. And you can't, like, coffee's not a sin, is it? Well, no, of course not. But when we want coffee and we want it now, guess what? Our culture has put a Tim Hortons on every single corner so that we can have instant gratification, whether it's good for us or not. The ability to take and have whenever we want is right there. That becomes a part of all that we do and all that we are. I want it, so I just go get it anytime I want. 
it feeds into that idea. And coffee's not bad. I have a cup over there and a cup there and another cup over there. I love coffee. But if it has its grip on me versus I have a grip on it, it becomes so different. But our culture will feed into that. And it'll be like, oh, you want it? We'll monetize it and make a way for you to have it anytime you want. It's, that's just the way it's built. And it becomes systemic in how we do this. No matter it's health for us or not. We create paths for the easiest way, the widest road. Way back in 1831, Henry Bond, reflecting on Proverbs, said it like this, the road to hell was paved with good intentions. Sometimes even our best intentions feed the sin nature in us rather than the sanctified nature. Our best intentions aren't good enough to save us from sin. And as we can read in Genesis 4, sin sin is crouching at the door and desires to have you. It's waiting there, ready to pounce on you. And when it does, it doesn't care for you. It doesn't love you. It doesn't give you what it promised you. It doesn't give you anything like that. Instead, what does it do? It exposes you. It weakens you. And then when you are at your lowest point, It mocks you and it abandons you to deal with the effects of your choices. That's what sin does. So we see how sin presents itself in us individually, collectively. We see how it is a condition of our hearts that leads to our sinful actions. We see how the consequences of sin and its power affect our relationships as an, an eternal aspect of who we are our relationships with God, others, ourselves, and the world. And so how do we respond to sin in the power that it has? And after, you know, speaking such heaviness about the effects of sin, and we're all sitting here going like, man, wow, sin. And I don't want you to feel heavy in this moment. And this is where we can feel the weight lifted, the condemnation removed, the judgment passed off, the, pre- the present weight and the eternal consequences alleviated for us. How? Because if we choose, we can respond to sin with its only solution. In 1 John 1, 7 to 10, it says this, and this is the message that we've heard from him and declare to you that God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. I want to stop there for a second. Just read that again. The effect of sin leads us in the darkness. And if we walk in the light, we have fellowship. And you'd think he'd say fellowship with God in that moment. If we walk in the light, we get to skip and frolic with God. But what does he actually say? You can see it on the screen there, right? We have fellowship with one another. By walking in Jesus and walking in the light, what it should do is have its effect that this, the effect of sin is no longer present in how we connect and get along. It should transform our relationships when we walk in the light of Jesus, as his blood purifies us from all sin. Now, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. And so we take ownership of who we are and what we do. That passage that we read earlier from Ephesians, it finishes like this. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. 
Or the, the verse we read in Romans, from Romans, in Romans 7, Paul saying, the wretch that he was, what did he say? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our sin condition, there's nothing that you and I can do about it in our own strength. But in Jesus, you don't have to perform. You just have to trust. In Jesus, you don't have to fix everyone because you can pray for anyone. In Jesus, you don't have, you don't have to be outraged by the sin out there. You can be, but you should also be equally offended by the sin in here. In Jesus, there is accountability, but there is also redemption and reconciliation. Remember, sin always results in death. And we who are dead in our sin needed a Savior who could take the effect of sin from us. And that's why we read in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So beautiful that the condition and the actions that we always fall prey to, that God was willing to take that and become that so that we could become his righteousness. Isaiah 53, 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. And so we come individually and collectively to God and we confess our sins. But we do more. We confess our sin nature. It's not just about saying, oh, this is what I did this week. God, just, can you just forgive me for that? But it's to say, God, you know my nature. You know that there's a battle inside me of my sin nature and your nature, and I want to continually let you know that the sin nature that wants to rob me of my future, I, I confess it to you and I give it to you, and I know that it's covered by your blood. We rely on him for our righteousness. David in Psalm 139 has given us these lines that maybe some of you know well, where he says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me. Remember, anything offensive is settling and taking and going for less than God's ideal. And lead me in the way everlasting. Sin always leads to death. But following Jesus and living with him, walking in the light, leads us to the everlasting. So today, we do so again. We ask God to search us, to test us and lead us in right living, having broken the power of sin to walk in humility and to walk in freedom. Today, we will take a moment in just a minute to, to take communion. And if, if you haven't got one of these and you wanted to partake in communion, if you don't have one, you can just raise your hand and one of our usher team will, will uh, come by and uh, make sure that you do have one. But today, we want to personally reflect on where we are before God. But we also want to, uh, I want to give you almost like an assignment this week. For you just to understand the power and the effect of sin, just observe culture this week and notice how the power and the effect of sin affects our culture. Not to do so in a judgmental way and see, oh, look, they're all like this, because it's our culture. We're all a part of it. But to see the depth of the effect of sin in our culture, just observe and contrast it to what you know God's ideal would be. And then remember that the only solution to that is Jesus. Is God transforming our hearts and setting us free? No man-made system will alleviate the grip of sin from our hearts. Let's pray. God, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you 
that you love us so much. We thank you that even though sin is powerful and sin corrupts and sin ultimately leads to death, God, you didn't leave us without a way out. You didn't leave us stuck in that. But God, you provided a way for us to be whole and healed and redeemed and made right before you. And while we're not fully there, while we're anticipating the everlasting of what it looks like to live in perfection with you, we stand redeemed before you. We we stand when you look at us, you look down, and because of what Jesus has done for us, you see us as clean before you. You free us from the bondage and death of sin, from the power of sin. And so today, God, we want to, in a minute, confess. We want to share in, the, the, in communion as we remember what you have done for us and the cost it was to you in order to redeem us and break the power of sin. And if, there's, if there's someone here today, either in the room or online that is watching that that wants to cry out to you and say, God, I've, I've yet to receive your forgiveness like that. I've yet to confess my sin actions and my sin condition to you, God. But I want to, in this moment, confess that I am indeed a sinner. I am indeed stuck in sin. And I want to be free. Now is that moment to confess and believe and trust that God can set you free. And we thank you for that, Jesus. We thank you for the power of the cross, the power of your sacrifice, your perfect life lived out for us. You taking on the sin of the entire world, the sin condition of the entire world and creation in order to be redeemed. We thank you for that.